So we'd like to discuss the American way of life, the society and culture, and the ramifications on politics and economy based on what you wrote about and why America failed, as well as your blog posts uh, and what you mentioned about McFarland uh, USA. So maybe just to start, if you could uh, briefly talk about how you view that old original American spirit, uh, as you described, the Puritan uh, republicanism. Well, the Puritans were not just one thing. Um, certainly, the original settlers uh, fell into the category of um, acquiring property. And the fact that uh, America offered a, a very large real estate, so to speak, and they, they were very interested in that. Um, it's just that uh, mingled in with that was the belief that uh, the goal, an important goal, was public service. So they weren't just one thing, um, and uh, there were a lot of conflicts around the issue of uh, individual acquisition of property, which is a big thing, and also the idea of public service. Um, but the Puritans were important in that. <coughs> excuse me. Going back to about. Uh, you know, 1616, there was a, a great interest on the part of Puritan divines in this theme of serving the community. And so what I argue in the book is that uh, that was uh, increasingly a minor theme. And um, as the years went on, you only had a few alternative voices. So I talk about uh, Emerson and Thoreau. And later on, um, um, John Kenneth Galbraith and uh, uh, Lewis Mumford and Jane Jacobs, and then finally Jimmy Carter in 1979, who made the last public pitch on the part of a political figure uh, that uh, consumerism couldn't be the purpose of life. But there was the alternative tradition, and... Um, if that was a respected voice in 1616, uh, although not without contention, as I said, by 1979, uh, the day after um, Jimmy Carter made that famous speech, it was in Annapolis, I'm trying to think, July 15th, I think it was, of 1979, the day after several congressmen stood up on the floor of Congress and argued that he was clearly insane, that he lost his mind. So we went from a position that was contentious to a position that was regarded uh, as equivalent to dementia. Um, and uh, that, that's a, a, not a bad a skeleton description of what's happened to the United States. And I found it interesting, I think a lot of us here would think that this has happened in more recent times, but I think you point out in the book that this transition began very long ago, almost at the beginning of the, the founding of the U.S. Um, how would or you... even before, I mean even before, because because I'm talking about 400 years back. I, you know, in the beginning of um, Why America Failed, in the first chapter, I talk about uh, the interest of the English in coming over in the late 16th century. And uh, the notices were like contemporary um, real estate brochures. You know, the property that's available and, and so on. So from the first, it was about hustling and exploitation. And um, democracy, uh, I don't know, I mean, it existed in a sort of uh, nominal way, uh, but that frequently became the cover for that hustling and exploitation, you know. I mean, now it's just kind of a joke. I mean, when we destroy Iraq, for example, we talk about making it a democratic society, but we're interested in their oil, we're interested in control of the Middle East, and so on. And this is no great secret. I mean, you know, everybody understands what's really happening, despite the talk of democracy. Okay, well, um, we'll start with a student question here. So, oh, okay. Hi, it's uh, a pleasure. I uh, my name is Guillermo, and my question is, you talk that, you say that 
the United States it's it's in the end like of their civilization like in the last Oh okay okay gotcha So so I see this like as a transition of like the hegemony hegemony mm -hmm. and like how do you think this will occur like is it just an economic transition or like is there like another like great war for this to occur Well you know the the first book there there are three books I wrote on Uh, the Collapse of the American Empire. And the first one uh, is called, in that series, which I published in 2000, is called The Twilight of American Culture. Uh, this exists in Spanish, El Crepúsculo de la Cultura Americana. And I identify by the, the, the real spine, you know, the central hilo conductor of that book is a comparison with the Roman Empire. And what I say is that we can identify four crucial factors that were responsible for Rome uh, collapsing or disintegrating as an empire, and that these four factors are uh, also present in the United States right now. And if we don't act to reverse them, there's no way we could avoid the fate of the Roman Empire. So it wasn't just one particular thing. I mean, for example, one was the great divide, the gap between rich and poor. I mean, they couldn't pay for their imperial adventures, and so they were increasingly in debt. And uh, the third factor was that people were getting increasingly stupid. Um, there was a dumbing down of the culture in Rome. Uh, we see it in the records, and of course, it's quite obvious in the United States today. And then and finally, the last factor was what I called spiritual death, that um, there is a loss of belief in the central purpose of uh, the empire or the United States, the American empire, you know, and that uh, there is just a lack of willingness or interest, really, a loss of heart, uh, you know, to continue the project. So I would say that... You know, there are other factors involved, and that's why I you wrote sequels to the to that first book. But um, it's not just one particular thing. I mean, in the case of any uh, decline of any civilization, um, you know, pick your historian. Joseph Tainter says one thing. Oswald Spengler says another. Arnold Toynbee says another. And as far as I'm concerned, they're all right. You know, they're all correct. These factors are not mutually exclusive. They cluster together. And that's what I pointed out in the Twilight book. They cluster together. And now they're bringing the United States down. And, you know, I didn't really expect that anybody would pay attention and say, oh, look, this guy wrote a book cautioning us, so we better reverse what we're doing. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not totally delusional, believing that somehow anything I wrote would have an impact. Um, but it's interesting, in the 16 years since that, since that book was written, in the case of all four of those factors, things have gotten worse. And the United States has pointedly aggravated all of those four factors. I mean, just to give you one example, the Chinese now own $2 billion dollars in American securities, like treasury bills. And the Japanese own about a billion. These are what, you know, I mean, this is part of our national debt. They own the debt. And if they decided to pull the plug, which they won't do because they are happy to receive the interest on that money, but if they decided to pull the plug and call in that $3 billion, dollars, the United States would collapse. The economy would collapse. Now, everybody knows this, at least in the government, but they don't talk about it. They talk about it, things as though everything's healthy or something like this. But that's just one example because that ownership of American securities was much less. I don't know what the figure was. was much less in the year 2000 when I published this book than now. And all these other factors have gotten worse. So the it's to answer your question, it's not like there's one particular thing, but you put all these vectors together, so to speak, and the decline is inevitable as far as I can see. 
And <clears throat> as you mentioned in your book, uh, citing William Williams, how the U.S. began from the ec economic expansion to geographic expansion to manifest destiny, and finally imperial imperialism, as we've been talking about. And I think ob objectively looking at history, that's the end of the cycle. And, and how would you just briefly respond to people who, you know, I still have people who say America is not an empire or they don't see this decline uh, in the U.S. I mean, well, what would you say to those people? Well, most Americans don't see the decline because most Americans don't see anything. <laughs> Americans, you know, you know, Americans don't have the kind of education uh, that's historical or sociological. They just don't think in these terms. Americans are happy if you give them a smartphone. <laughs> you know, or a satellite channel. These are not very bright people. And that's one thing I've emphasized over and over again. And it was also one of the four factors that I compared with Rome. As time went by, people got more stupid. And right now, it's, I mean, if you went out on the street, just any, any street of any American city, and found an American and wanted to talk to them about the decline of empire, they wouldn't even know what you were talking about. They wouldn't have the foggiest idea. And so it's, it's not like they can grasp these things. And, you know, they can't. There's, it's only a very, very tiny percentage of the country that thinks in these kinds of terms, you know. But there was another part to your, your question uh, that I missed. What was it? No, that, that, that was uh, that was pretty much it. And uh, I, I, we have another question from a, a student here. Okay, okay. Why, why is the American dream uh, elusive or or a lie? Why is it alive? Yeah. Or a lie? A, a, a lie. Mentira. Yeah, mentira. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, lie live. I couldn't distinguish there. All right, why is it... Um, why is it a lie? Uh, well, uh, it's a lie on many levels. You know, a few years ago, a great American comedian, George Carlin, died, unfortunately. He was wonderful. And one of the things he said was, they call it the American dream, because you've got to be asleep to believe it. Now, there was a joke. Now, the issue is that it's a lie on a whole number of levels. Uh, and so we could talk about all of those levels, but just to give you the most obvious uh, level is that um, we now have a situation where 18% of the American population is unemployed and has no prospect of getting reemployed. That's going to be their life. Um, that's quite large. In terms of people who go to bed hungry in the United States, the real figures, as opposed to the, you know, official statistics, something like 40%. Uh, it's quite grim, and uh, Americans are quite desperate. Unfortunately, they don't blame the government or Wall Street or anything like that. They usually blame themselves, um, which has some truth to it, but you know it's only a partial truth um the another way in which it's a lie is that the american dream is one of infinite expansion technological and economic and the problem is that we don't the the, the planet doesn't have the resources for infinite expansion the planet only has finite resources so we can't be talking, unless we're insane, we can't be talking about infinite expansion. And yet, that's what the corporations uh, in the United States wish to do. There's no end to the attempt to squeeze the last drop of oil out of the Earth's crust, to keep fracking and destroying the planet. There's no end to it because the ideology is one of infinite expansion. However, reality has different plans for the United States than the United States has. And uh, in a whole number of levels, that American dream is hitting a wall. It's because people understand that on some unconscious level that the United States is increasingly violent. Um, if we define a massacre as the death or wounding of four or more people, 
there is more than one massacre, more than one massacre mm -hmm. per day occurring in the United States. Now, that ought to tell you something about the nature of the country. Since between 2001 and 2011, the police have killed more than 5,000 unarmed civilians. That ought to tell you something about the nature of the country. There are repeated incidents of people going completely insane over trivia. Somebody uh, comes to a McDonald's and they want, uh, I don't know, chicken McNuggets, and they happen to be out of chicken McNuggets, and the person, this woman who was named Shanika Torres, you know, returns to McDonald's with a machine gun and then, you know, shells the place. She's now in a correctional facility in the state of Michigan. But sort of like every month, there's a fast food incident where people go nuts. They will call emergency, you know, 9-11 to get the police because they didn't get a cheeseburger. Um, this is not just, it's not just mental illness. It is mental illness, but it's not just that. It's, a, it's an awareness that the American dream has failed and Americans don't know how to deal with that. So they shoot people and uh, they get very excited about Chicken McNuggets, you know. <laughs> we have uh, another question from... Uh, okay. I would like to go back to what we were talking previously about the American Empire. And okay. Assuming that the American Empire is collapsing, as to say, what would you say comes next? Well, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> How do you think uh, American leaders, officials, and politicians should handle the situation? Is there a way to prevent it or making it less harsh? Or is it just... Yes, uh, yes. I mean, years ago, I wrote about the fact that there was no stopping uh, the decline of the United States, and we could deal with it graciously rather than stupidly. But the historical record is that the United States doesn't deal with things graciously. It deals with things stupidly. And that's what it's doing right now. So, for example, how would it be possible uh, for a normal country, quote unquote, to actually regard somebody like Donald Trump as presidential material? This is evidence. This is more evidence that the country is collapsing that somebody like Donald Trump could actually become president. And uh, I don't think right now, I mean, there are various things that could be done. As I said, I, you know, I was terribly hurt and offended that the United States uh, didn't read my book, The Twilight of American Culture, and immediately change everything. Uh, I was so surprised that they didn't, you know, follow my advice. But um, that's a joke. But uh, the, the thing is that it's too late. It's too late. And in fact, in terms of the decline of civilizations and empires, Arnold Toynbee pointed out that in the declining phase of an empire or a civilization, what it will do is precisely what it shouldn't do. In other words, if it had half a brain, it would do the opposite of what it's doing, and instead it accelerates the decline. And this is not just the, you know, the United States or American civilization. The British did it as well. Roman Empire did it as well, and, and so on and so forth. And we're seeing that today. Um, if I had to paint you a scenario of how I think this is going to play out, when I say it won't be pretty, eventually... Perhaps not this election cycle. I'm expecting that Donald Trump will not be elected president. But sooner or later, as the economy continues to fall apart, sooner or later, a demagogue like Trump or like Hitler will emerge. And that person will get elected. And they will do incredible damage, like imposing martial law throughout the nation, for example. There's going to be increasing chaos and rioting and migrations. And in fact, the Pentagon has already, you know, has plans, contingency plans for how to deal with that. And there's some suggestion, I can't prove it, but there's some suggestion of the, the, the army carrying out 
exercises in the American Southwest for handling uh, food riots and large, you know, crowds that um, are enraged or starving. And so when I say it's not going to be pretty, I'm talking about about 20 years away, 30 years away, something like that. The the problem that uh, we've had with a figure like Obama is uh, he doesn't really understand what's going on. And his idea of being a president was nothing more complex than crisis management. In other words, let's just keep the lid on things. Now, Hillary will probably be the next president, and it will be an extension of the Obama government. It will be more crisis management. But sooner or later, as things really start to deteriorate, crisis management won't work anymore, and we will probably have a Trump-Hitler-type figure getting elected to office. Um. <clears throat> And you forgot to mention also about Obama playing a lot of golf, I think, right? Well, that's very important. That's very important. Um, I think we have one more question before uh, about uh, imperialism before we move on to Mexico and uh, McFarland, USA, and your comments on that. Okay. Well, I am interested in knowing... Uh, I want to ask you if you can go deeper on the describing why Donald Trump is so popular and another... Uh, Fast, uh, small question is, uh, why do you think Hillary Clinton is going to, to win the presidential campaign? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let's start out with why Trump is popular. Um, there are two reasons. And one is that there's a very strong nativist reactionary streak in American, American society and in American history. It's a very ugly streak, and it's a streak, it's a streak that hates foreigners and believes that they are the cause of our problems. So when Trump first emerged on the scene and got popular, it was because he said that Mexicans were rapists and that basically the people that were crossing the border were the worst element in Mexican society and that they were stealing their jobs, they were race, rapists, they were horrible human beings. They were criminals, he said. So if you talk like that, there's a section of the American public that's going to get excited and is going to vote for you if you talk in those terms. It's a very ugly feature of American politics and American history, but it remains a reality and has been for a long time. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are two people right now that are extremely popular. One is Trump and the other is Bernie Sanders. I haven't checked the election results for New Hampshire, which the voting was today, the Demo, you know, the primary. But last time I checked, with 1% of the precincts of the counties reported, uh, Bernie Sanders had 60% of the vote. And in Iowa, he tied Hillary Clinton for the vote. And the question is, why is Bernie and why, is, why are Bernie and Donald so popular? One, in the case of Donald, is this nativist sentiment. But it's also the case that both of these guys talk spontaneously. They are authentic. They speak their beliefs. And unlike Hillary and the other candidates, they don't come across as plastic. Um, the other candidates all talk like they're talking from a script. And Americans know this, and they find it boring which is, you know, an accurate perception. Um, the Bernie and Donald speak right from the heart. And Americans are responding to this because the rest of the candidates, Hillary included, are plastic. Now, the reason I think that Hillary will win the election is because I think that Trump is going to become the... Uh, Republican candidate for president. 
And once that happens, he won't stand a chance against Hillary because he's too far out. That nativist streak is too far out of the American mainstream. And so Americans will look at the two candidates, Trump and Hillary, and they will say, well, you know, she's had a lot of foreign policy experience. She's had a lot of government experience. Um, and on top of that, you know, she will be funded in a way Bernie will not. She will be funded by major corporations because she's a very wealthy person. These are her friends. And she wants to keep uh, the wealthy people in the United States happy. And so they will fund her campaign. So I don't think that Trump will have much of a chance you know, right now, his high percentage figures in the polls exist because they are percentages of Republican voters. But once we get to the entire spectrum of the country, I don't think he'll have much of a chance against Hillary. As I said, I think that's about 10 or 20 years down the line where a real Hitler-type demagogue will be able to win. We are not yet at that point. And as a result, I think Hitler, uh, Hillary will defeat uh, Trump, and uh, she will, uh, you know, I, I'm expecting her to be the president for the next eight years. But, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just making an educated guess. Let's talk a little bit about Mexico and what you've been writing about recently on your blog. Um, you you mentioned the tension, well, you mentioned the, the film McFarland USA, which I hope some of my students, uh, they have seen before before this talk. And you mentioned the tension in the story and the central theme being uh, revolving around the Mexican and the U.S. value systems, the warmth of the traditional Hispanic family structure and culture versus, you know, the power, the go-go world of U.S. capitalism. So before we look at, you know, how they interact, how would you describe as a foreigner you know, living in Mexico, what is for you traditional Mexicana, the old Mexican dream before it started pursuing the American dream, let's say. Well, it's a very complicated, it's a very good question, and it's a very complicated topic. Um, there is a famous anthropologist, he's now dead, in uh, 1987, uh, he wrote a book called Mexico Profundo. And his name is Guillermo, uh, Guillermo Bonfil Bataya. And he was a great anthropologist. And Mexico Profundo is an argument that uh, all of the foreign influence on uh, Mexico, starting from Cortez, never really made a difference that there's a base of Mesoamerica that still exists, and it's the real Mexico, the traditional Mexico, the Mexico of community, the Mexico of curanderos, the Mexico of uh, relational, small, small uh, villages and relational society. And he said that that really is the real Mexico, and eventually um, it will outlast the influence that uh, Mexico has suffered from Spain and France and now the United States. Um, it's a very, I mean, the book is a very powerful book. I don't know if I really agree uh, with, uh, you know, the thesis. Um, but he's on to, he was onto something. He was onto something that there was a Mexico that he had something imposed on it, and that uh, root, that traditional root, has never really gone away. And frankly, I see residues of this all the time in the way Mexicans relate to each other, as opposed to how Americans relate to each other. I see it all the time, and I've experienced it all the time. Another article on my blog uh, is called, uh, you'll have to dig in the archives for it, but it's called Love and Survival. And it's about a time, a couple of years ago, I needed placas mexicanas for my car, and I went up to Reynosa, where there's a 
uh, I have a Mexican family here in Guanajuato, but there's a branch of the family up in Arenoso. So I drove up there to uh, get Mexican plates from my car. And these are people who didn't know me except through my family here. And, I mean, they just took me right in. I stayed with them for a week. They did everything possible. They got me the license plates. I mean, it was sort of like an amazing kind of experience for a gringo to go through. <laughs> and this, I think, is what uh, uh, Bonfil Bataille is talking about, that there's uh, a traditional family structure and way of relating that doesn't really exist in the United States. In the United States, children are largely left to fend for themselves, latchkey kids, they come home from school, nobody's there. Parents are too busy making money. Um, it's a very, very different type, type of society still. Now, the reason I say I'm not entirely sure about his thesis is because I know that Mexico has gone through a very strong Americanization. I think that's very unfortunate, but it's real. And um, uh, who was it? Uh, Joseph Contreras wrote a book called In the Shadow of the Giant, which was about the influence of the American dream on Mexico, and that's something I've been thinking about writing about. But this is this is the, the, the whole thing. It's the question of, you know, last year I published a book on, on Japan, and in Japan, it seemed to me it was much more obvious that there was this traditional substrate, and that when Japanese capitalism and consumer society finally fell apart, which I think it will, that they would revert to their historical roots, um, which was a traditional craft community type of society because they had the experience of that for 2,000 years. Well, Bonfil Bataille argues something similar about that for uh, Mexico. I'm just not sure it's true. I mean, I, there's a big question mark here for me, but I know that the Mexico of villages in Chiapas is rather different from the Mexico of Mexico City, you know. And maybe we can look at just a few examples, as you mentioned on your blog, of what happens to, uh, well, I guess the, the Mexican American imported dream and what's happening to some Mexicans. For example, you, you cite a study by Professor William Vega at the University of California, California, which revealed that the rates of mental is illness among Mexicans living in the U.S. was almost twice that of Mexicans living in Mexico. Another, another quote is um, citing someone that says, I know a lot of guys from here who've gone north and returned really different, really cholo. They changed their personalities, their ideas, their clothes, their whole way of being. They don't have the same respect for their parents and that often migrants lose their sense of community obligation and they become very North Americanized. So maybe if you can comment on, on what's happening to the, the Mexican. Yeah, the, the study by Vega to me was very interesting because the question is, if the rate of mental illness is twice that, uh, Mexicans in the U.S., twice the rate of mental illness as Mexicans in Mexico, then what's the cause of that? I mean, that's the first question that would arise. And, uh, you know, I read that article a few years ago, so I don't really remember if Vega speculated on the cause, but to me, um, it boiled down to a difference in value systems. That is to say, if a Mexican goes to the United States, um, they are not going to a connected society. Mexico is a connected society. If, just simple example, if I need to have something repaired in my house, then I mention it to Ana, I call her mi hermana. I mean, it's part of my Mexican family here. And she says, let me talk to so-and-so. And before you know it, there's sort of like a chain of discussion going on until they locate a mechanical or albanil who then shows up and he and I become friends, which did happen. And we, we have this whole discussion and he fixes, you know, the beam that cracked or whatever it is. He charges me next to nothing. And the next time I need help, I'll call him or I'll run into him in the center of town and we'll have a beer. That's how Mexico operates. It's a connected society. In the United States, when I lived there and I needed something repaired, there was no network to contact. I had to look things up in the yellow pages. 
So I'm looking up air conditioner repair, something like that. And the guy shows up, you know, two hours late. And he's surly and uh, uh, kind of angry. And he re- does the repair. He charges me a huge amount of money. We exchange probably three words in the entire time that he's there. And I'll never see him again. It's a very unpleasant experience. True, the the air conditioner or refrigerator, whatever it is, gets fixed. That's nice. But the point is there's no human dimension to it at all. And this is the norm in the United States versus the norm in Mexico. And so those are the kinds of choices, the tension that you have between two ways of life. Okay, we have a few more student questions. Mr. Maurice, within within the Mexican society, where do you think there's the, the strongest American influence? Well, I would say it was economic. Um, 80% of the goods manufactured in Mexico are sold on the American market. So the, the, I think the greatest impact uh, would be... Um, Uh, on in trade, you know, economic trade and exchange. Uh, but the second, which is a close second, is the whole world of narcotraficantes, because the way of life in the United States is so oppressive and it's so alienating that Americans need drugs. They need drugs just to get through the day. Now, there are a lot of different types of drugs. There's alcohol and um, tobacco and cell phones and television. I mean, there are all kinds of drugs. But people that are really interested in you know, heroin or cocaine, that is, starts in Colombia. It makes its way up through Latin America. It arrives in Mexico, processed and refined, and then it goes across the border. And that's why you have the whole industry of narcotraficantes, and also, by the way, lining the northern side of the border are little shops that will sell you guns. And these guns are purchased, and they make their way back into uh, Mexico. And then this is where you have the gang wars um, between drug lords. Um, So it's not that... Mexico doesn't bear some responsibility for the whole drug situation because I think there's a lot of corruption, especially, you know, on the federal level and so on, and maybe the local level. That's a whole other discussion. But the United States is the market for uh, very high-powered drugs, and that's, that's a second economic impact, I think, on Mexico. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, student here. The question is, uh, well, I think like the American way of life already, we know that it's a mess and it's all over the place. It's in the entire world. So I heard a lecture which you said that some student asked you how to get out of the mess. But my question is the entire opposite because we are students of international relations and I think that we have a common goal on we have the mission of making changes, but the mess is way too big. So how do you think that us as students and going out to that mission, how should we engage, you know, making a change or how should we start? That's the question. Well, that's an important, you know, That's an important question. It's a question of what any of us can do against this system. First of all, let me recommend a couple of things for you to to see besides the movie McFarland. There's a movie called Anesthesia, and uh, it's quite a brilliant movie, released last year. And in it, it's a very good x-ray of American society And in it, everybody is on some sort of drug. They're on wine or television or cell phones, or uh, they engage in cutting their bodies. Everybody is looking for a way 
to go numb, to be unconscious. It's a very powerful film, and it is a very good portrayal of what's happened to the United States. The other is a TV series. Uh, season one took place last year. It's called Mr. Robot. And I highly recommend this, you know, that you get the DVDs and watch this, uh, at least the first season. I think this year is the second season. But I highly recommend you see that because it is, a again, a portrait of the United States that is living entirely in fantasy. And the fantasy is called the American dream. And the way in the, in the, um, in the first film, Anesthesia, there is no way out. I mean, people are just caught in this trap. And the only way out is uh, spoken by a professor at Columbia University who's very humanistic and says you can only live your own integrity, which is an individual solution. But in the TV series Mr. Robot, there's a political solution. Uh, that is to say, there's a group of hackers that hack into uh, the databases of uh, major corporations. And finally, they're able to erase most of the records of debt. And suddenly, these corporations don't exist anymore. And so there is a revolution that takes place. Uh, it's a cyber attack on the major corporations. So that's the solution in this particular series, you know, and you might want to think about that. What students can do in a program of international relations, uh, you know, I mean, you as well as I know that you're up against forces that are enormously powerful. Um, since when I talk about the problems of the American dream, most Mexicans have a hard time understanding me because their idea is to go to America and make a, a huge amount of money, which they think is going to happen. So it's hard for me to get an audience. They have to do it themselves and see that it doesn't work out. There's no reason they should pay attention to me, and there's no reason they're going to pay attention to you. But you have to do whatever you can from the place that you're at. And the important thing is to speak, to write. After all, I'm just one person. I have very little influence, but that's all I can do is speak and write. And that's what I do. And that's what I encourage you to do. I figure, you know, maybe 50 years from now, after the United States is just a bad memory, maybe some student, you know, historians will dig through libraries and they'll come across my work and they'll say, hey, 50 years ago, this guy had the right idea, you know. But um, that's not a happy scenario <laughs> for me, obviously. But it's probably the truth, you know. Nevertheless, you know, I just have to do what I do. And if you're serious, about bringing about change, you commit yourself to that path and you walk that path regardless of the outcome. You know, Gandhi once said, nothing you do will make any difference, but you should do it anyway. Excellent question and students agree, excellent uh, answer. We have a final student uh, question. Okay. Hello, my name is Alexa. Um, regarding the last part of your blog, when you talk about the va balance there should be um, between trad traditionalism and individualism, and then at the uh, the last part you ask, I mean, I mean, you say that the next question to be asked would be, what would true success for Mexico be, and how is it to be achieved? Um, I would like to know. I mean, I know this is a, a question that you personally have, but I would like to know what are the um, like the start of that answer, or what are your, the main leads of what you would answer to that? I didn't have any answers, which is why I left it as a question in the article. I don't, I don't have answers to that. What I can say is that what the film shows, I think, is a certain type of wisdom, and that is uh, that traditional, you know, every, every society, every civilization is a package deal. And that means that there's a, an upside that's very valuable, but there's also a shadow side. And every civilization has this. And in the case of that film, McFarland, what it showed was that if the Chicanos living in California 
had just stuck to the program of their parents, which was to be recollectores, recollectores, you know, that they would have gotten nowhere. They would have been making, you know, wages that amounted to next to nothing. Uh, they would have had no education. It was their traditional society was closed. It may be warm and it may be very supportive. And that's my experience of my Mexican friend, you know, me and my Mexican friends. But nevertheless, it was a closed circle and they weren't going to escape it. And then you have this character, which is real. Jim White comes into the town and he has a very different set of values. And he breaks open that closed society to their benefit. Because by the end of his influence, all those kids went on to have middle class careers, uh, ones that were worthwhile and intelligent and they could make a decent living and so on. So the American influence in that case was very positive. At the same time, he was influenced by traditional society because he was coming in with a whole ideology of the American dream, and that is you know, you don't get emotionally invested in anything around you. You just use it as a stepping stone to a bigger career. And that's what life is supposed to be about. And what happened was the Chicano community taught him something different, and he started to become a human being. So what happened in the collision of these two cultures was an outcome that was beneficial to both. Now, again, you have to realize that this movie was made by Walt Disney. <laughs> You know, it's a very romantic kind of movie, but it did happen. I mean, Jim White is a real person, and that did happen to that to that community, and presumably to Jim White, because he didn't take the higher-paying job in a white school in Palo Alto. He stayed in McFarland, and he lives there to this day. So uh, these are complicated questions. I don't I mean, when I ended that essay with those questions, they were just questions to which I don't have the answer, but if clearly I wanted to write a book about Mexico, which I may do, uh, having been here for nearly 10 years, if I do that, obviously I'm going to have to think about what the answers to the questions are. So I might come back to this class a couple of years from now and find out what you guys have figured out, and then I'll put it in my book. Dark Ages, Mexico. Uh we can't wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it will be a little brighter than that, but you never know. <laughs> well, um, if you can I'd like to write. I would like to write a book called "Why Mexico Succeeded." You know, that that would be. I th yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> um, well, any final thoughts you have, and as well as you could tell us about uh, your re most recent work and what you're working on now. Uh, yeah, most recent work is this book on Japan. Um, it's called Neurotic Beauty. Uh, Sexto Piso Editorial is translating it, and it will appear this year in May or June um, under the title, well, straight translation, Bayeza Neurotica. And uh, you can locate it from www.sextopiso.com. And uh, so that was my, it's not quite my most recent book, but at least it's, it's now going to appear in Spanish translation. The most recent book that I did uh, will appear in English uh, in about two or three weeks. Uh, it's a novel called The Man Without Qualities. Uh, um, and it's a satire on American politics. And uh, I think it's loads of fun. Um, I had a good time writing it. Uh, I just sat on a couch in uh, my apartment in Mexico City, and I wrote it in 12 days. It was sort of like a miracle. And uh, James Howard Kunstler, who some of you, American writers, some of you may know, uh, wrote a blurb for it in which he said that I was the Voltaire of the modern age which I thought was uh, quite a compliment. I'm sure it's not true, but, you know, it was nice that somebody would say something like that. Anyway, uh, it's a funny book. I you know, hope you guys can read it and enjoy it. Uh, the trouble is I have not been able to find a 
Mexican publisher or Spanish language publisher for it. So I'm still looking around for that, but I'll keep you posted and hopefully that won't take too long. Okay. Uh, we'll check out that stuff, especially the stuff translated into Spanish. And we thank you a lot for giving us uh, your time. Um, uh, here's the student. No, thank you. This was, this was, it was good to talk with all of you and, uh, I got a lot out of it. I think these were really important questions. And, um, you know, I want to encourage all of the students in their uh, careers, and hopefully they'll be able to make a better Mexico in the future. We hope so. So here's the students uh, signing off and saying thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Al contrario. Al contrario. <laughs>